Folks, we're off to a new lecture topic, and this lecture topic is going to be concerning acid-base chemistry. Now, I know what you're thinking. Acid-base chemistry? What on earth? Why do I have to go through this again? I thought that you said that the first lecture module was the review of GenChem, and now we have to go back to GenChem? Well, the funny thing here is that they did introduce acid-base chemistry in general chemistry. Or at least I hope they did, because if they didn't, they weren't doing their job, and you need to tell somebody. So acid-base chemistry, they probably skimmed the surface of. You know, due to the lecture, due to the material, due to the semester that you have, 16 weeks in total, they really can't give you a very good job of acid-base chemistry with everything else that needs to be talked about. So some of this stuff is going to be a review again. I'll just go ahead and warn you. But there's going to be nuggets of information scattered throughout the lecture that's going to be brand new. And these are topics that are specially targeting the the organic chemistry side of the house. So it's very important that we go through the basics. Again, I'm on a garden back to basics, and I am going to talk about the basics of acids and bases. And this is where we're going to start out. That way, if you had a crappy teacher in the past and you really didn't understand acids and bases like the way that you were supposed to, then this review might not be a review, but the first time that you've actually learned this material. And if so, I'm glad that you joined us. So buckle up for the ride. So acid-base chemistry. What can I talk about or what can I say about it? Well, we have acids and we have bases in a laboratory. Okay, we know that they're there. These are probably terms that you have heard before, and we've often related it to a pH scale most of the time. So pH of 7 is going to be neutral, and anything less than 7, and they typically tell you 1 in general chemistry, is acidic, and anything greater than 7, they typically tell you 14, is going to be basic. Now here's the problem, folks. That was the number one lie that they gave you. If you had an instructor that said pH starts at 1 and pH ends at 14, they are lying to you. This is not true. pH can actually go lower than 1 and it can go negative. That's right. We can have negative 2s and negative 3s for pH values. And pH can actually go above 14. I mean, we can go and have 20 and 30 and 40 as far as pH is concerned. So 1 to 14 is what we would call the working range of these substances. Everything that we use in a laboratory that is common will typically, typically have a pH of 1 to 14. But we can very easily go lower and we can also very easily go higher. So that is the number one misconception that people typically have here because they are so trained in thinking that pH only goes from 1 to 14, and that is a bold face lie. So do not let people lie to you that way. Always question the material that they tell you, and that also includes me, all right? So acids and bases, a pH scale. And back in the day, before all of chemistry really came around, the term acid and base really relayed or was related into how they tasted. Yeah, that's right. You would go into a laboratory, you would dip your finger down into a chemical, and you would taste it. If it tasted sour, these were regarded as acids. And if they tasted bitter, then they were regarded as bases. Folks, could you imagine going into a lab and taste testing chemicals? I think I would have some of the faces that you're seeing on this screen right now. So if you take a look, I'm going to immediately look over here to the right hand side and you see this little baby's face and that little baby has just bitten into a nice sour lemon 
and that lemon is sour because the sour taste is related to the acid, the citric acid, as well as some others that are located in that citrus fruit. So this is the way that we really classified acids and bases back in the day. It was all about taste testing. Was it sour or was it bitter? And those were the determination factors of these two different types of categories. Now, as you can imagine, this really did not last forever. So, of course, this didn't make any sense. As we improved, as the science improved, as the definitions improved, we got away from the taste testing. No longer do we require students to test acids and bases with their tongue in the lab anymore. But we now look at its activity on a chemical level. So what do I mean by that? Well, an acid is going to be defined most of the time with us as a H plus donor. So this is a hydrogen donor. So if it has a hydrogen, that hydrogen could possibly get removed and spit out into solution. And if that's the case, then this has donated a hydrogen. It's kicked it out of the house. It's kicked it to the curb. It's turned 18. It needs to grow up and become an adult. And that hydrogen has to go out and kind of make mends for itself. Well, if it does that, these are very acidic parents. Those parents have kicked the H plus out of their house and away it goes. Well, the hydrogen's going to constantly search for a home. And it just so happens that there's some bases in the world and those bases are hydrogen donors. Okay, or sorry, hydrogen acceptors. So these people look at that poor little hydrogen and say, oh, I feel so sorry for that little hydrogen. It has nowhere to go. It has no home. Nobody likes it. It's on its own. Well, we've got an available room. So why don't we let hydrogen move on in with us? And if that's the activity of the molecule, then that molecule is going to be regarded as a base. Folks, these are the two basic definitions of an acid and base that are out there. Now, I don't know what you learned in general chemistry, but there are multiple different types of definitions. I'll show you those in just a second. But this is the main definition that we will be using throughout the class. These are hydrogen donors and hydrogen acceptors. We have a term for these definitions because remember I told you there's more than one set of definitions for these and this is going to be called a Bronsted Lowry definition. So whenever we talk about Bronsted acids and bases or Lowry acids and bases, this is what we are referring to. So don't let those questions throw you off when they start putting a name onto the acids and the bases that they are wanting you to discuss and solve problems with. These are the traditional definitions that we use in organic. Now, I keep saying there are multiple definitions, right? This is not the only one. Bronsted Lowry is great. Great. Bronsted Lowry does the job that we need it to do in organic, but there are also two others that are sometimes mentioned in general chemistry. And I don't want you to forget about those. They are out there. So up here at the top is a definition that we call Arrhenius. So the Arrhenius acids were hydrogens in water, and the base definition was an OH in water. Okay, so there was a problem with this definition. It was great in the beginning, but one of the problems here is that water is included in the definition. And as you know, water is a very polar molecule. At this point, you should be pros in determining the uh, Lewis dot structure for water and assigning polarity with it. So this is a very polar structure. Most of organic is nonpolar. It is not based in water. It's not based in aqueous solutions. So for organic, this really doesn't help us that much because we are rarely going to be involving water as a major component, at least as a solvent. Okay, organic is based in nonpolar solvents and water is not one of them. 
So the Arrhenius definition was not perfect. So the Arrhenius definition was great in the beginning. It wasn't perfect. It put restrictions onto the definitions. You had to have it in water. And these are what the molecules are doing in water. So if it releases H plus in water, that was regarded as an acid. And if it released OH in water, then this was regarded as a base. So along comes the Bronsted-Lowry definition. The Bronsted-Lowry definition says, well, we're going to leave water out of the definition. We know that not everything can take place in water. So the Arrhenius definition is kind of archaic at this point. We know that we can define acids and we can define bases whether they are in water or whether they are in non-aqueous solvents. It really doesn't matter with the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So the Bronsted-Lowry definition, if it gives off a proton, which is what we call this, a proton or a hydrogen, then this is described as an acid. And if it accepts that proton or if it accepts that hydrogen, then this is defined as a base. And this is really where the world of organic chemistry kind of centers on. So these are the definitions that we are going to use most often. But there is also another set of definitions out there, and this is number three, and that's the Lewis definition of an acid and a Lewis definition of a base. And notice it doesn't have anything to do with hydrogen. The reason is because we have compounds that can act as acids, but they actually do not have hydrogen that's associated with them. So this was looked at as a improvement upon the Bronsted-Lowry. This is a set of definitions that allows us to label things as acids and bases if hydrogen is not involved. Okay, well, sometimes this is going to be very rare for us to see in organic chemistry. So with the Lewis definition, they focus on electron pairs. So it accepts an electron pair for an acid, and the base will donate an electron pair. So those electron pairs are those free dots that we were drawing back in the last lecture module. And these free dots represented a pair of electrons. If it can donate a pair of electrons like this, it is a base. And if it accepts those electrons, then it's going to be regarded as an acid. Again, the issue here is that this is very rare for organic, at least in the very beginning and throughout the majority of the semester. So for this reason, I'm going to tell you to cross out the Lewis definition of acid and base and the Arrhenius definition of acid and base. They are out there, they are defined, they are plausible, and they are correct. But we will focus on Bronsted-Lowry instead for the most part in the entire semester of Chem 251. Okay, so hopefully I've got my point across. But at the same time, I do want you aware of these definitions. So do not be surprised if you see on an online quiz or an in-person test that I ask you to define these. What is the definition of an Arrhenius acid? What is the definition of a Lewis acid? And how is it different than the definition of a Bronsted-Lowry acid? Be prepared to answer those types of questions. But from here on out, we're really going to use the Bronsted definition of an acid and a base in order to do our job. Okay, now I said something that might throw you for a loop and I just want to clarify it again because we're building foundation and I'm acting like this is the first time that you've seen it. And that's the definition of a proton. And I called this H plus a proton. And some of you might be questioning, well, why did I do that? Why did I just not call it hydrogen? Because that's exactly what it is, isn't it? Well, if I look on the periodic table, hydrogen has a one atomic number and a 1.01 as a mass number. So if I go through and if I tell you to label the number of protons and the number of electrons and the number of neutrons for hydrogen, you would look at this atomic block on the periodic table and you would say, oh, atomic number one. So 
one proton, one electron, and then one minus basically one is zero. So this is zero neutrons, and this is correct. However, this is a hydrogen plus. This is a ion, and in particular, it is a cation. All right, so the cation has this positive charge up at the top. Again, T for positive. So what this means is that it has done something to the charge, and the only thing that can change here that we learned in the last lecture module was the number of electrons. So the protons stay the same. Nothing happens to those, just like before. The neutrons stay the same. Nothing happens to those, just like before. And then the electrons come in, and the electrons are the ones that can be lost or that can be gained, and these carry with them a charge. So what we have here is a positive charge. The only way that this can become positive if it loses an electron, all right? That's the only way that this can happen. So we did have one electron in the normal state. Now, because it's a positive one, we lost one electron, and that brings this total to zero. So folks, look at what you got left. Subatomic particle wise, the only thing that you have left right now is a proton. So a hydrogen plus ion is the same exact thing as just one proton. That is it. It's lost its electron. It didn't have any neutrons to begin with. It's the only subatomic particle left. So really, at face value, it is just a proton. And that is why I use that terminology sometimes when I talk about these acids and these bases. So we can write H+, we can call it hydrogen or hydrogen ion, but quite often you're going to see me talk about this ion as a proton, and now you know why. Now you know the true story, and knowing is half the battle. See, look, I gave away my 80s inner child, didn't I? Okay, so let's take a look at some questions. Here's a question. It says, which of the following are not acids? Okay, so they want you to think that this is a very complicated question, but actually it's not. So the acid category, we are going to default, and we're going to look for hydrogen donors. That's what we're going to look for, unless it tells me something in particular, like using the Arrhenius definition or using the Lewis definition, but quite honestly, they're not going to do that to you. They want you to use the Bronsted definition most of the time, and that means a hydrogen donor. Therefore, if it does not have hydrogen, it cannot donate a hydrogen, and it cannot be an acid, correct? Okay, so we'll work through these one by one, and if I look at the first one, CH3COOH, oh look, there's this little hydrogen all by itself out here. Well, that little hydrogen can be donated, boop, off it goes, if given the right circumstance. And because that hydrogen is present, because there is a possibility of removing that hydrogen, then this, ladies and gentlemen, is an acid. If I look at CO2, there is no hydrogen that's here, so by no means can this actually be an acid because there's no hydrogen to donate. The HNO2, well, I see a hydrogen right here in front. Under the right circumstance, I could probably get that to remove that hydrogen and persuade it a little bit. You know, some parents, they're a little bit stubborn. They need a little bit more persuasion by their friends and family to say, it's going to be best if you just kick that hydrogen on out. You know, your life is going to be so much simpler. You know, it's time for them to grow up and learn how to live life on their own. So you just need to go do it. So these are the certain circumstances that I'm talking about. Well, it does have a hydrogen, so therefore, check, that is an acid. If I look it down below, I see the H right there in front again. I'm just going to circle it and say, you know what, that is a hydrogen. At least there's one. That's all that it takes, just one. So that hydrogen is present, and therefore, we can check off that box to say, yeah, it probably can be an acid at a certain point. And then CCL4. CCL4, there is no acid that's present, so we're going to cross that out immediately because we know if there's no H, then it cannot be an acid by the definition that we like to use. 
Folks, that's all that you got to do. This is how difficult these questions should be. It should not be hard to look at these things and figure out what is an asset and what is not. There's only one rule, though, and the rule is, I'm not going to say a tricky one, but it's something that you're going to have to remember because people get so accustomed of looking at these structures and just finding an H. And if you look at this first one, you're going to see H's that are attached to this carbon to the left, CH3. You do not want to count those hydrogens when you make your determination. Notice I didn't even talk about it. I didn't circle it. I didn't mention it when we did the example. I only circled this hydrogen on the end. That hydrogen's attached to an oxygen, all right? This hydrogen's attached to a nitrogen. This hydrogen is attached to a carbon as well. However, however, we also have another hydrogen here on the end. This one, again, is a little bit of an exception. I told you organic chemistry is full of exceptions. There's more exceptions than there are rules, I believe. However, if you see a traditional CH3 or something like a CH2, then you do not count those hydrogens. Those are not going to be regarded as acidic. The problem area here is hydrogen onto a carbon and then blah, 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 blah. Do you count that hydrogen? Do you not count that hydrogen? That is always the question that people have. And we're going to become more familiar with that role as time goes on in this lecture and throughout these videos. But this is the warning that I'm giving you at this point. So look for your hydrogens. If you find them, then give it a check mark. But if those hydrogens are CH3s or CH2s, you do not count those as acidic, but all of the other hydrogens just go ahead and say fair game. The other rule that I like to mention to you are the two hydrogens here in these examples. You see them written right here in the front. If hydrogen is written in the front, then this is a very good sign that this thing is acidic. That's the traditional way to write an acid. When we write acids, we like to put a focus on the hydrogen that would be acidic. And if those hydrogens show up in the very front like this, then this is a very good sign that the molecule, sure enough, is acidic. So by knowing that rule, if you looked at this one, and you said, oh, well, that hydrogen has attached to that carbon. I don't really know if I should count that one or not. This rule would override that because I've just told you if hydrogen is written into the front, it is almost a sure guarantee that that hydrogen is acidic. So you can comfortably say, yes, this thing is acidic after this point. All right. Uh, another type of question that you might see from this kind of lecture material so far, which of the following is not a Bronsted acid? All right, so not a Bronsted acid. Bronsted acid means it has a hydrogen that can be donated. So ALCL3, there is no hydrogen here to donate. So this thing is not going to be an acid. All right, no way, no way it meets that definition. CH3OH, look, there's the CH3. I told you do not count those hydrogens, but if there's any other hydrogens, you count those. And it does have one, right there it is. So that could be acidic under the right circumstances. If we persuade that molecule to kick it to the curb and we do our job really good, then that molecule will kick that hydrogen to the curb and become an acid. C, hydrogen's written in the very front almost a surefire way that that thing is going to be labeled as an acid. D, BF3, there is no hydrogen here to donate, so therefore this thing is not an acid here. So finally, E says, well, your other choice is A and D. This is a multiple choice question, okay? So which of the following is not a Bronsted acid? Well, we labeled A as not one, and we labeled D as not one. So the correct answer here is going to be E. So don't let these questions trick you. 
Make sure that you double read the question. Make sure that you're looking for these words like not because they do like to trick you very often. I hate to admit it, but they do. These questions could be tricky because they want some of these a little complicated to make you think, quite honestly. So you just want to read the question twice. Make sure that you fully understand what they're asking. And then just go through and use some reasoning, like we did here, to determine what is an asset and what's not before you choose your final answer. Okay, I'm Regis Philman. Before you click in and before you secure your final answer, use a lifeline if you have to, use Google, use your textbook, use your lecture notes, use something before you choose those answers. But don't do it on a test. You can't use that stuff on a test. All right, so that's where this video is going to stop. In the next video, we'll truck on and we'll talk about some other basic terms that they introduced in general chemistry that you should be aware of at this point.